10 quick questions, rule scenarios, National Federation of High School Basketball Rules. Let's get going. Greetings and welcome back to another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert, the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, we lift them off the printed page, breathe life into them, simplify, clarify, amplify, so that you can take them with you onto the basketball court. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with abetterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official here in the San Francisco Bay Area for over a decade, and I consider myself to be a basketball rules expert. This show is designed to help you on your journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Have to give a shout out, as we do before every show, to our fantastic show supporters. Sylvia Bigot, Mike Sakurai, Jeff Jewett, Mark Sato, and Mike Wong. Much appreciated and much love. You want to buy us a coffee? You can always go to abetterofficial.com slash coffee. There'll be a link above. All right. So last week, we covered correctable errors uh, at a better official. This week, our first place scenario finishes up on something that we brought up in our coverage of correctable errors last week. Let's take a look at our very next place scenario. Dribbler A1 is fouled. It is the seventh team foul on team B. The officials erroneously award a throw-in. During the dead ball, A1 is replaced by A6. The ball is inbounded, and while Team A has the ball in the front court, the table alerts the crew of the error. The officials rule that free throws will be attempted by A1, who will re-enter the game, replacing A6. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay, so we had a scenario last week in Correctable Errors where we talked about this very same play. And I was unsure of the answer. A lot of people in the chat, Mike Connors specifically, I recall, said absolutely A1 is coming back in the game and they're going to shoot the free throws, no restriction against. Didn't quite sit with me. But we have clarity. Hey, so we have clarification, National Federation of High School Basketball Rules, rules interpretation from way back in 2005, 2006. This was before I was officiating. Situation A, situation one, A1 is fouled by B1 late in the second quarter. It's a common foul and the seventh foul. Bonus situation not recognized. Substitute for A1. A6 is beckoned onto the floor and becomes a legal player by rule. A1 is now, has left the game, and under normal circumstances would be required to sit until the clock properly runs. But the table informs either before the free throw has ended, uh, before the throw-in has ended, or after the ball is inbounded and the team has control, The table informs that it should be one-on-one ref. And the ruling, this is a correctable error situation and falls within the proper time frame for correction. In both A and B, A6 leaves the game and A1 re-enters to shoot the bonus free throw. Play is resumed as after any free throw attempts. Clarity on the rule. A1 is allowed, and actually it sounds as though they are required, unless they were injured or indisposed in some fashion, to re-enter the game and attempt the free throws. So, do, 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 do. In this situation where the officials said A1 will re-enter the game and attempt the free throws, were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. All right. Next play scenario. During the jump ball to start overtime, jumper A1 bats the tip, which caroms off the tossing official's head high into the air. 
A1 then jumps and catches the ball before it touches the floor. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Kind of a humorous situation. Hopefully nobody's hurt. During the jump ball, the one of the jumpers bats the ball, I guess it's in a downward direction, contacts the, the tossing official on the dome, and the ball bounces high into the air. Imagine the energy in the building when that happens. The jumper leaps and catches the ball in the air. The officials make no ruling of illegality on the play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Let's look at the rules and restrictions regarding a jump ball and jumpers. Jumpers are not allowed to contact the ball a third time. They can contact the ball twice legally before the jump ball ends. And we always, with any of the restarts in the game of basketball, jump ball, throw in, free throw, we need to know because during those restarts, there's a special set of rules that are brought in that only apply during the time frame that the event is occurring. When does the ball become live? That starts the, or, or when does the jump ball start? When does the restart start? And when does the restart end? And when do the restrictions end? So in this instance, a jumper is not allowed to contact the ball a third time. And they're also not allowed to catch the basketball during the jump ball. So when does a jump ball end? It ends when it is touched by any other player on the court, the floor, or either basket or backboard. Okay, Because a backboard, when contacted, is considered to be at that spot of the floor. So what about an official? It's not addressed in the rule. But what we know is that the official, a ball contacting the official, is considered to be contacting the floor at that spot. So in our situation, jump ball, player bats the ball, and it hits the official. It would be the same as hitting the floor. If it hits the floor, our restrictions have ended, and the jump ball has ended, and that player is legally allowed to catch the basketball. So, in this instance, were the officials ruled that this was a legal play? Were the officials correct? Yes. Yes, they were. Fred, I guess there was a debate going on at officiating.com slash basketball, a great resource for basketball officials. Officiating.com slash basketball. It's a chat room, a very knowledgeable group of officials there to discuss basketball rules. When I first started officiating, that was my go-to place. This was in an era before uh, Facebook uh, groups exist existed, and it was an invaluable resource for me. There's incredible rules knowledge available. Officiating.com slash basketball. I will put a link in the show notes. Let's move on to our very next play scenario. After Team A scores in the last 10 seconds of the second half, and before the ball is at the disposal of Team B for a throw-in, A1 grabs B1 in an effort to have a foul ruled and save time or stop the clock. The officials rule an intentional foul on A1 and B2 is awarded two free throws. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Okay, team is obviously trailing. We're in the final seconds. They release a try. The ball goes in the basket. Before the ball is at the disposal of the thrower, player intentionally fouls in an effort to have a foul ruled and the clock stopped. The officials rule an intentional foul and will award two players to the offended, two free throws to the offended player and the ball at the spot nearest the foul. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Again, we have to be experts at status. Live ball, dead ball. 
If the foul occurred during a live ball scenario, that would be the correct ruling. But after a made basket, the ball becomes dead. And until it is at the disposal of the thrower and the official has begun a count, then by rule, it is still a dead ball scenario. So now we have an intentional foul during dead ball, which makes it a technical foul. And that is going to change, although the team will be awarded two free throws, that will change who can attempt the free throws and where the resulting throw-in is. So it's just a little window where we can do something that appears logical, but by rule, this is a technical foul since it occurred during a dead ball time frame. A1 is fouled and awarded two bonus free throws. A1 misses the first. After releasing the second free throw, A2 fouls B2 while positioning for a possible rebound. And the second try misses. So the officials are then notified that an error was made and it should have only been a one-on-one -one scenario. So it's correctable rules error scenario. Should have been one and one The second free throw was unmerited. The officials rule that we will disregard the foul that occurred during the free throw, and that's what they and go to the point of interruption, which would be a possession arrow throwing. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So we have a situation where the officials erroneously believe that two free throws should be awarded in a correctable error scenario. The first attempt is missed, and the second attempt is missed, but while the ball is in flight, there is illegal contact and a foul is ruled. The officials are ready to report the foul to the table, but the table says, hey, 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 hey ref, 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 that last one should have been one on one and not double bonus. Not two free throws. So that means that our second free throw was an unmerited free throw. We are within the window to correct and we will make the correction. And when we have an unmerited free throw, we are, as officials, are instructed to disregard any common fouls that occur. We're not going to disregard technical, intentional, or flagrant fouls. Had this foul been, you know, an elbow to the face that was ruled uh, intentional or flagrant, that would not be disregarded. But in this instance, we disregard the foul as if it didn't happen because it occurred during an unmerited free throw. We go to the point of interruption. Point of interruption would be, since the free, first free throw was missed, would be a possession arrow, alternating possession throw in at the spot nearest to where the free throw missed. If the fir first free throw was successful, then we would go to the point of interruption, which would be an end line throw in for the opponent of the thrower. Hey, if you find this kind of content valuable as a basketball official, now's the time to do all the things. Hit like, subscribe, notify, so you don't miss out on any of our new content. Also share the video with other basketball officials who could find value as well. All right, let's look at our very next play scenario. A1's try enters the basket and gets stuck in the net. After a second or two, A1 reacts by contacting the ball so it will pass through. The officials rule a basket interference violation on A2 and award the ball to Team B for an end line throw in. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So sometimes the basketball is just a little too big and the net's just a little too small and the basketball can become suspended within the net on a made goal or after a try has been attempted. So we need to know, we need to have an understanding of when a goal counts. And a goal counts when it passes through the basket or remains in the basket. 
This ball was in the basket. The goal is scored at that point, the point it gets suspended. The player subsequently contacting the ball should be disregarded in this instance. So, in this instance, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. Score the goal and line throw into the opponent. Let's look at our very next play scenario. A1 is disqualified for receiving a fifth personal foul. Later in the game, A1 re-enters the game as a substitute. The officials recognize it at the first dead ball after A1 re-entered the game. The officials rule a direct technical foul on the head coach of Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Well, this would be a fine how do you do. We have got a disqualified player. They go to the bench. Later on, they re-enter the game. The ball becomes live. Are they a legal player? And at the first dead ball, maybe the opposing coach says, hey, he fouled out. Right? Table says, yes, he has five fouls. Confusion reigns. The officials assess a direct technical foul on the head coach. Were they correct by rule? Yes. Yes, they were. The head coach is responsible in this situation. If a player who has fouled out re-enters the game, that is the responsibility of the head coach. But in this instance, the head coach is responsible for that player re-entering the game. That is a direct technical foul on the head coach. Two free throws for the opponent and the ball for a division line throw in opposite the table. We're going to move on. Let's look at our next play scenario. A1, with both feet in the air, catches a passed ball, lands on one foot, jumps, and finally lands on both feet simultaneously. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right? Player catches the ball in the air, bounces off one foot, lands on two feet simultaneously, like they're playing hopscotch. Don't bump, right? Legal by rule. But what is the player then not allowed to do, right? Player in this situation can do many things. They can pass, shoot, call timeout. But there's something that they're not allowed to do. It's an obvious thing. If we know the rules and restrictions regarding traveling, And that is, they are not then allowed to have either foot be the pivot foot. When a player catches the ball in the air, bounces off one foot, jumps off one foot, lands on two feet simultaneously, that is a legal play by rule, but they may not pivot at that point after, the, after they have landed on two feet simultaneously. Right? They've caught the ball in the air. Their first contact with the floor holding the ball is off of one foot and then two feet land simultaneously on two feet. We all know a player can jump, catch the ball, land on two feet, and then either foot can be the pivot, legal play. In this instance, jump, catch the ball, land on one foot, then two feet, but neither foot can be the pivot. Legal play, but neither foot can be the pivot. Within the traveling rule, there's a, it allows legal footwork for a player to catch the ball in the air jump off one foot and land on two foot. That's specifically allowed by rule. Remember that um, when, when it comes to rules of high school basketball and rules, there are different types of rules One or there's different scenarios. One is this action in the rule is specifically prohibited by rule. This is illegal. Another is this action is specifically said to be legal. This is illegal, this is legal. And then there's also a third scenario where it is not addressed. It is not specifically say that a player can jump, catch in the air, jump one, land two. And we have to apply other rules that we know to the scenario to determine. But in this instance, this, this 
situation is specifically addressed by rule and said to be a legal play, but that the player may not then have a pivot foot. Let's move on to our next play scenario. Team A is wearing red uniforms. The officials notice that A12 has a red hair control device, A22 has a white hair control device, and A32 has a yellow hair control device. The officials rule this to be legal. Pretty straightforward. Hair control devices have no color restrictions. By rule, okay, great. What's a hair control device? We have to know that as our most important role as basketball officials is being the fashion police, right? Not an enjoyable part of our role as officials, I find. Nobody wants to be in that position. There's so much, we're dealing with teams who get information that's inconsistent. Last night they said it was legal. This night they say it's illegal, right? A lot of challenges related to understanding of uniform rules and equipment restrictions. But hair control devices are, are very simple. They go around hair only. A head band is something that goes around the head completely and has skull. It has skull within its circle, right? That's a head band, color restrictions apply. Hair control devices could have 25 of them going down a ponytail, legal, no color restrictions, not a thing. Let them play ref. All right, let's look at our very next play scenario. A double personal foul is ruled in the front court near the sideline while A1's try for goal is in flight. The try is successful. Team A has the possession arrow. The officials score the goal and report the double foul and award Team A an alternating possession throw-in near the spot of the foul. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. They, <laughs> the officials have uh, made some mistakes on this play. So we have a try in flight. We probably have two players positioning for rebounding action. Perchance they've, they're, they're both hooking each other and pulling at each other and pull them both simultaneously pulled to the floor. The ball goes in the basket. The officials rule a double foul, right? That's the key, double. Double foul, double technical. Double. In either instance, in this case, a double foul. We will never shoot free throws and we will go to the point of interruption. Has our double foul caused a try in flight to become dead? No, no. Double foul does not cause the ball to become dead. Score the goal and our point of interruption would be an end line throw in for the opponent. We're not using the arrow here under any circumstance. Let's say the player was just dribbling the ball in the front court. Double foul is ruled. It's going to go to the team that was in control of the ball at the spot nearest to where the ball was. Okay, so major mistakes made on this play. This is the kind of scenario as well that if we make a mistake in this situation, it is absolutely a crew mistake. It's not official A saying this is what we're going to do. And, and the rest of the crew says, okay, sounds good to me, right? If we have any knowledge about the correct ruling on the play, we have to step forward. Even if we're working with that 25-year-old vet, 25-year veteran and we're a first-year official, if we know the rule, we need to stand up for the game. Put the game first. Game, crew, you. Partner, this may be an embarrassing moment by me saying that we're gonna do it differently or we have to do it differently or we must, here's what I have, but we need to make, th make the correct ruling as a crew. And if we kick it, we go down as a crew. All right, let's move on to our very next play scenario. 
With only a few seconds left on the clock, A1 attempts a try from the backcourt, which lands far short. The ball bounces near the free throw line and up towards the basket. The horn sounds, and then the ball goes through the basket. The officials score the goal, but rule it a two-point goal. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So, last second try, length of the court, player's just not strong enough, but they do get it way up in the air. The ball uh, bounces, let's say near the lane line, bounces high in the air, the horn sounds, and the ball goes through the basket. What do we do next? Right. So we need to know a few things. We need to have these with us in our pocket when we go on the court. We know when a try ends. Okay. Now we do know, as we talked about uh, in, a, in a, a, some previous episodes, that a ball thrown from behind the three-point arc that enters the basket would count as three. So we had the alley-oop play where the player beyond the three-point arc releases a what's clearly a pass to a player who's going to attempt to catch and dunk the basketball, but the ball goes in the basket. And that is ruled a three-point try, even though it is ruled a three-point goal, even though in our judgment, it was not a try because the rule says by rule, any ball thrown from behind the three-point arc. So that could like affect our thinking on a play like this. But when does a try end? A try ends when it is obvious it will not be successful. So once the ball became short and went below, let's say, the level of the basket and it was obviously not going to in, in, go in, that try had ended. Okay, so since it was no longer a try, the ball entering the basket, even after the horn, if a try entered the basket that was in flight, entered the basket after the horn, it would be a successful goal. But in this instance, since it was not a try, the ball became dead immediately when the horn sounded, there should be no goal on the play. So were the officials correct? No. No, they were not. So next week, at a better official, will be free throw week. On Monday, a master class. Free throw rules and restrictions. Wednesday, basketball rules expert. Rules-based play scenarios where we can look at rules and restrictions. And on Friday, Five Play Friday, live, 7 a.m. Pacific, we will look at free throw adjudication plays. So free throws are on the agenda next week at A Better Official. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Now would be a great time to do all the things like subscribe, notify, and share the video with other basketball officials who could find value. Have to give a shout out to our fantastic show supporters. Sylvia Bigot, Mike Sakurai, Jeff Jewett, Mark Sato, and Mike Wong. Much appreciated and much love. If you want to buy us a coffee, you can always head over to abetterofficial.com slash coffee. There'll be a link above. We have additional video content for you here. Make your choice. Choose wisely. And we'll see you in the very next video. Take care.